We're live. Okay, great. Uh, hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this panel, uh, the Our Literary Mothers Influence and Inspiration panel. My name is Kay Tempest Bradford, and I'm the vice chair of the Carl Brandon Society Steering Committee, and I am your host for this salon. Um, we put this together because uh, Shreta wanted to have a, a conversation with other Desi authors about cool stuff that has nothing to do specifically with certain things. And here at the Carl Brandon Society, we think that this is an awesome idea. And so we have been doing panels uh, throughout the summer and we will continue to do panels actually where we just like let awesome authors of color come and talk about the things that they would love to talk about but they don't get to talk about at conventions. And also as we were just speaking about before this went live, it also gives us a chance to bring together people to talk together in a salon who normally wouldn't be able to because they're far flung all over the place. So virtual salons for the win. All right, so this is, um, as you all know, a fundraiser for the Carl Brandon Society. And uh, just very quickly, I'll let you know that we are an organization that is dedicated to um, basically expanding the influence of people of color in science fiction, fantasy, horror, and other speculative fiction, be that uh, on the side of writing and publishing, but also on the side of fandom, because fans are just as important because fans read the books. And so um, we do what we can to support this. We have um, scholarship programs to send writers of color to Clarion and Clarion West workshops. Um, we also give awards and we will be announcing our awards later this year. That's going to be very exciting. And we also have a few other programs. And this is one of our newest ones having these panels like this. So if you want to learn more about the Carl Brandon Society and support us, you can go to carlbrandon.org. But don't do that right now, because right now we're going to have this lovely salon. And so um, let me pull up my notes. Um, I am going to have all of uh, everybody introduce themselves because they are the experts on how awesome they are. So why don't we start with Tanaz? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanaz Bhatena, and I'm a young adult author living in Toronto, Canada. I've written two contemporary novels, A Girl Like That and The Beauty of the Moment. And my latest book is A Venture into Fantasy, uh, Hunted by the Sky pictured behind me, is the first of a YA fantasy duology set in a world inspired by medieval India. Uh, its sequel, Rising Like a Storm, comes out next year, and the cover reveal happened today. So I'm really excited about that. Woohoo, awesome. Yay, cover reveal. Um, all right, Tanuja, you're up next. Hi, Hi I'm Tanuja desai Idie, and I am calling in from Maine. Um, we moved back to the U.S. after 17 years in London, which was after about a decade in New York City. So interesting time. I was going to say interesting time to come back, but interesting time to be in a lot of places. Um, so my first novel is called Born Confused, and it's um, a coming of age story about an Indian American uh, protagonist living in New Jersey, New York um, during. Oh, <laughs> thank you for that. Actually, I have a. Uh, <laughs> I got a whole bunch of your books here, all of you. Um, so that, that's my first novel. It's a coming of age, cross-cultural, uh, diaspora, American story. And um, the sequel, Bombay Blues, is set, it's the same set of characters for the most part, and it's set in um, Bombay when these characters all head back to the motherland, um, thinking they're going to find some answers there, and they end up with more questions. Um, and I'm working on my uh, a couple of projects right now, the third in that series, and another book that um, has overlapping themes, but it's a, a different set of characters. And I also do music, so I've made albums of original songs to go with those books, and I'm kind of working on songs simultaneously now as well. And I have a 15-year-old and a 10-year-old who may appear at any moment. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very, thank you for including me on this panel. And I'm very excited to get to see all of you live and um, your work is wonderful. And I look forward to getting to know it better as well. Thank you. Awesome. I'm always, I really love the whole like pairing music with a uh, fiction thing. Like it always excites me when there's somebody who's doing that, especially if like it's their own music, their own fiction. All right, Prerna. 
let me unmute myself before I start talking. <laughs> Hi, I'm Prerna Pickett. I'm the author of my debut, If You Only Knew. It came out uh, this past February with Swin Reads Macmillan. Um, and it's about a boy recently released from jail and the daughter of the prosecutor who put him away and how they fall for each other against the odds. And there's some motorcycle racing, some street artistry, and lots of romance. <laughs> And I'm here in Boise, Idaho, uh, and I have five kids that are currently keeping themselves really busy, but my husband is taking care of them. So <laughs> I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited. I feel very honored to be a part of this panel because I enjoy all of your works and um, you're all very inspiring to me. So cool. <laughs> all right, up next is Karuna. All right, hi everybody. I am Karuna Riazzi. I am the author of three middle grades, starting with The Gauntlet. I always keep my books so I can flash them, which is a middle grade inverse Jumanji um, with Middle Eastern and South Asian flair. And that came out in 2017 from Simon & Schuster's Salam Reads imprint. Um, its sequel, The Battle, came out last summer. Um, and the paperback actually came out the other day. So happy book birthday to me. I had no idea. Um, they probably told me and it probably slipped my mind because of the world and everything that's going on. And I also had the honor of rewriting the Jungle Book for the Ghostwriter series with um, Sesame Workshop and Source Books Wonderland. Um, and this is the book I like to call my um, chance to make um, Rudyard Kipling um, turn over in his grave. And I'm really proud of it for that opportunity of reclaiming that story. Um, and yeah, I'm in New York. I'm also very, very happy to be here and to see all these lovely faces. And I'm really freaking out that I am on a panel with so many greats, like the author of Born Confused, which I think for a lot of Desi authors right now was really crucial, um, you know, for them and their formation and their coming of age. So I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. All right, Swati. Hi, I'm Swati Thirdala. I'm the author of the Tiger at Midnight trilogy. Uh, I actually have books for one. So this is the first, oh no. Okay, so I'm gonna cover my face, but this is the first one. <laughs> and then um, The Archer at Dawn, the second in the trilogy came out uh, just, this, just this spring. Um, and I like to pitch it as just enemies to lovers in a magical ancient India. So if you like action, adventure, and a ton of romance, this is a series for you. Um, I am in New York City. I actually also, um, by trade, am a marketer in the tech industry. So it's really fun to be able to do a lot to do a lot of these panels and to kind of take a step outside of my normal, um, you know, usage of Zoom, which is for meetings. Um, yeah, and super super honored to be on this panel. I'm so excited to hear from all of you. All right, and last but not least, Shweta. So hi, everybody. I'm Shweta Tukrar. And as Tempest said, this panel was my brainchild. I, well, we have, you know, as, as uh, Karuna already said, we have our queen of Desi Y right here at the Nuda who, uh, and this is, this is the copy that I found when I was 22 and I was working in publishing in New York City there would be these brown bag lunches where they would you, you would go to different publishers and they didn't feed you, hence the brown bag, you had to bring your own food, but they would ask you to bring books from your publisher and put them on a table. And then if, after some boring lecture, I don't even remember what the lecture was this day, they, you could go to the table and pick, you know, it was a swap. So you would take somebody else's book. And I saw this, this copy back in, when would that have been, 2002. And I was like, there is a book about a Daisy girl. And as soon as the lecture was over, I wasn't even listening, I was just waiting. I ran to the table and I grabbed it and I have had it and I am now 41, I'll be 42 next month. I've had it for almost 22, 20 years. And that book made me so happy because I had never seen anything like it. And, you know, I've loved reading my entire life and I'd never, ever, ever seen a book like that. The only time I'd seen characters like us were where we were relegated to side roles or was some horrible thing like Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And I'm trying not to swear here because I'm trying to keep this family friendly Tempest, but, you know, just a racist, horrible stuff, caricatures. 
and th this book, I mean, my family was not like Dimple's family. Dimple's the main character in a lot of ways, but Dimple is Gujarati like me. And it just made me feel seen in a lot of ways. And I, I just decided later when I was decided to start writing professionally that I wanted to do the fantasy version of this and also make people feel seen because I, I won't name the town, but I grew up in a very small farm town in Indiana, which, and I don't even normally say Indiana, I normally say the Midwest, that was, and I grew up thinking I was very ugly and stupid because that's what people told me. And I'm, I'm neither of those things, but when you're a teenager and there's nobody and you know, there's nobody who looks like you and there's nobody to tell you anything differently. I just kept, when I was older, I just kept thinking how a book might've helped if I had seen myself. And so for readers today that the new did for me when I was in my early twenties. And I have to say really fast too, that I just got an email from somebody I went to college with and who told me she's now working as a librarian and she bought my book. And now I will hold up my book. Star Daughter, which just came out last month, and I'll uh, I'll talk about it in a second. But she she had bought it for her collection, and 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 so she she said, I don't know if you remember me. One of my eighth graders just came by and saw your book sitting on my table, getting ready to be filed away. And she was like, "That's a really good book. I just read it. It was so good to see myself as in a book." And I was just like, "My heart, my heart. like that's exactly what I wanted." And you know, and I have no idea who who else is reading this out there, and it, but just to know that it's out there. The same way that the new jazz book was is why I'm writing is why I put up with all the crap in the industry and all the people who told me no one would ever read a book like this and I should just self publish and all the other nonsense along the way for that. And so now I suppose I should tell you a little bit about, about me and about star daughters so I've always believed in magic very much so I've always loved I'm Hindu and I've always loved our mythology, and so. I wanted to put those things together in my writing and I started doing that in short stories which I began selling regularly in 2015. And then later in, and I'm, I'm so excited because some of you already beat me to this, even if I started before you did, like, you know, Swati, when your books got announced, I was so happy when Roshni Chokshi's books got announced, her first one, I was so happy. Uh, Karuna, obviously you and I have been friends for a while. I was so, you know, and I know what you're working on, which I'm so excited about. And, you know, I'm, and Prerana, I know the proposal that you're currently shopping around that I won't say anything about. And, you know, Thanaz, I got to read your book early and give you feedback. Like, all of this makes me so happy that we're we're finally getting to have a voice too. And it's it's about time. It's way past time, honestly. And and so yeah, uh, more voices coming up and joining us. And you know, and just one day there will be an entire library, as far as I'm concerned, full of our stories so that there could, you know, no one could ever hope to read all of them, which is just how it should be. And I'm, I'm so thrilled. And now I'll tell you a little bit about Star Daughter and then I'll let us get to the actual questions. So I got inspired by uh, Neil Gaiman's and Charles Vess's illustrated novel, Stardust. And so uh, my first novel I tried writing is Trunk now, and I'm actually cannibalizing my second book. But the uh, my, my second attempt at a, like, the work was Star Daughter. And it is about a, so it's a reimagining basically of Stardust. And it is about a girl named Sheetal who is half star and half human. And her mother, star mother has already gone back to the sky, which, uh, and the heavenly realm in, in Hindu lore is, is called Swargalok, or at least one of them. So she's gone back to Swargalok and left Sheetal on earth with her human father. And Sheetal has been trying to hide her, suppress her starry heritage, but as she, and just be human. But as she nears her 17th birthday, it starts to come back out and she accidentally burns her The only way to heal him, to heal a wound like that, is to, but it has to be pure, and hers is obviously diluted. So she ends up having to go on a journey to Swarglok with her best friend, Minal, who's the only one outside her family who knows what she is, and finds her mom. She discovers that the only way to get said drop of blood is to win a competition that she never even knew existed. That's so much. <laughs> she's got so many issues, but then like, she's also a star. Um, so before uh, I ask the first question, I just want to let you know, Shrata, that um, your connection was going in and out a little bit. Um, so just in case there's anything that you want to like try to do about that, it's cool, but we're all good here. All right. So um, since we're talking about influences, um, I also, I have a, a podcast where I like to talk to people about like, what is the like very first, like deepest seed beginning of your creativity? And I love asking this question because I always get really good 
awesome answers from authors. So um, I want to ask basically like when you guys look back on your youth, right? Um, what are the books or other pieces of media or authors or other creators that you like feel first inspired you to want to create what you do, like the first people to make you think like, oh, I want to do that. I want to write. I want to create. I want to whatever. Um, and and we can you can go all the way back to like, I was three when I stumbled on this thing or whatever um, you feel is like sort of the beginning of your path. Uh, so why don't we start with Tanaz? Um, so I was, I think, about eight years old, and my school had this annual magazine where they published all these poems and little stories by students. And so I was just like, oh, I just want to see my name in print. You know, I was just that kind of kid. I was that kid. I want to see my name in print. So um, so that time I used to send stuff and used to never get published and things like that. And uh, there was also this magazine called Young Times. So I was born in Mumbai, and then I moved to Saudi Arabia when I was one year old. And so I was living in the Middle East for a very long time. So Young Times was a magazine published in the UAE. And it was, um, it was distributed all across the Middle East. And basically, a lot of kids used to just send in their work there. So I uh, remember sending in my first ever short story over there when I was 11. It was about a werewolf at a girls boarding school. So it combined my love of uh, R.L. Stein and Enid Blyton into one mashup. And so I kind of wrote that story and it got published. And that's when I kind of knew that, okay, so this is something that I wanted to do. And I would read a lot of uh, Sweet Valley, a lot of Fear Street back in those days, but it, I never really saw any uh, books that I could really truly identify with. I mean, kids in American schools had lockers. I had no lockers in my school. I mean, we used to drag our bag, books in our bags and run around and just stay in one class. That was our sort of um, setup. So it was completely different. But then when I became a teenager, I discovered Ruined and Mystery. And I, for the first time, I saw people like myself, Farsis or Indian Zoroastrians in fiction. And then I discovered Arundhati Roy when I was in high school. I had to pick a book for an independent study in English. And I just picked that book up and I was like, I did not realize you could write English in a very Indian way until I actually started reading that book. And it felt very relatable to me for the very first time that my language or the way I could mold language or just play with it. I never knew you could play with language until I actually read that book. So for me, those were a few of the stepping stones that led me into this creative path. Well, and what was the name of the book again? Uh, which one for Arundhati Roy? Yes. Uh, the God of Small Things. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, Tanuja? Um, I heard Enid Blyton mentioned. That was one of my great childhood passions as well. And of course, now I probably read those with a little bit of a cringe at some <laughs> moments in those books, but I could not get enough of Enid Blyton when I was growing up. And we couldn't um, get Enid Blyton in the States, like even in used bookstores at that time, you just couldn't get copies of these books. So it was the stories themselves, but it was also the fact that they would arrive in, you know, the luggage of relatives visiting from India or somebody stopping, you know, in, in Heathrow, stopping in an airport in London and going into the bookshop and picking them up or, you know, going to India on a childhood trip and then finding like a crumpled up copy of Five on Finiston Farm, I think was the title, underneath the bed and then stealing away with it, <laughs> smuggling out my ink buttons. And I really had to, to wait. Um, I mean, as one had to do before, you know, Kindle and digital and all of that, but wait because, because I really had to wait for people to come bring me the books or to go back to get those books. So I absolutely love those books. I was always hungry reading them because they were always freshly baked scones coming out of ovens and <laughs> butter melting into the crevices. Um, so that that was a big one. Um, Pippi Longstocking was a, a, a real favorite as well. And I think in a lot of ways, there, there's a bit of her in, um, in one of my characters in Born Confused, Gwen, like this idea of this little girl who lived alone in this big house, you know, down the road or across the street, like some of that was in my mind when I wrote about the setup of that character. I absolutely loved Pippi with the red, you know, braids sticking out of her head. And um, Nancy Drew, 
And I can actually still see like where I learned the word Titian and Auburn and vivacious, you know, like you can often with childhood books, you can really kind of see this, the, the spot on the page. Um, so Nancy Drew was another one. I belong to a Nancy Drew book club. And I think every month or so, two Nancy Drew books would come into this one hardcover and you'd, you know, flip it over and the second book was upside down on the back of the first book. That was very exciting. And, and then I, I had the same, I didn't, I didn't see myself in any of those characters, but I just loved getting lost in those, in those stories. Um, but I did have a real love um, for stories about witches and like the little leftover witch and these kind of characters that were never quite fully allowed in. And I also was accused of being a witch when I was a child <laughs> and my family was the first, we were the first brown of our kinds in the town where I grew up. My parents were the first to immigrate from both sides of the family. Um, this was a town in Western Massachusetts. It wasn't Salem, but it was Massachusetts. And um, yeah, there were, there, there was this, this one um, incident that I only remembered decades later when I was writing Born Confused, even though it's not in the book. At where I was like walking um, in the dirt hills of this like unconstructed lot. We, we lived in a house and like the neighborhoods were sort of half built and somebody in the neighborhood, their cat disappeared and the parents called a meeting with my mother and with me to find out what I did with the cat because they saw me on a hill uh, whispering something and casting spells, which I was doing, but I was probably making up stories because that I did a lot of that, like walking around and kind of talking to myself and making up storylines. So perhaps that is to account for for this um, love of <laughs> of those kinds of stories. So Phyllis Reynolds Naylor was another one. She wrote Witchwater and like the Witch Saga series. So those were books that I loved. In terms of um, of writing, I think I started just writing as soon as I started reading. But in, in, I had like kind of three ring binders full of poems and little stories and things. But um, it wasn't until I started getting Cricket Magazine that it occurred to me that I could send something out there and maybe somebody else would read it besides, you know, my family or my teacher or, or just, you know, me, myself and my three ring binder. So um, Cricket Magazine was when I first sort of sent something, uh, se uh, several things actually out into the, to the greater world. Thank you. Fair enough. Is, um, is it my turn? Okay. <laughs> I was like, it was going in and out. Okay. So I have um, what I like to call these snapshots of, um, uh, of my reader slash writer life. So like the first snapshots starts in elementary school when I read um, The Witch of Blackbird Pond by Elizabeth Spear, uh, Elizabeth George Spear. I have notes, by the way, because I wanted to make sure I didn't mess anything up. <laughs> um, but that was the first time that I was, that a book just swept me away. And I was just fascinated uh, by the writing style and the story. And at that point, I, I mean, I wrote like, I used to write like uh, little poems and songs and my mom has like a collection of these um like ridiculous pop songs that I wrote in elementary school <laughs> but um, I hadn't really ever thought about writing a book at, or writing a novel at that point point. and then um the next snapshot is like middle school and reading Ella Enchanted um by uh Gail Car uh, Carson Levine and um that like uh, I that was the first time that I was like, oh, I really want to be a reader. Like I want to get into reading and find more stories like these. And, um, and I just love magic and I love, and I love anything that's just kind of makes you think, just makes you think about the beauty of like the world and stuff. And I think that, and it takes, sweeps you away. I just love those kind of books. And then in high school, I discovered uh, Sarah Dessen and she was the one who made me fall in love with contemporary novels. And then I read Born Confused, because and which my cousin gave me a copy of. She was in college at the time, and she found it and was like, "I think you will really like this. Here, read this." And I did. I enjoyed it. That was the first time I felt like, "Oh, that was the first time I had read a character that was Indian or American, and that was well Indian in general." And um, and I just thought, "Oh wow!" So this is something that can actually happen. And um, and and I 
and it was a contemporary novel and I just felt I related it so much to it and um, I really appreciated it for what it was and um, then I am and then another snapshot would be um, when I discovered the series called the and the first book is called The Daughter of the Forest by Juliette Morellier, um, Seven Waters Trilogy and and that was I think uh, those few last books like that I read in high school were the ones that made me start creating stories in my head and um made me really like it's like that burning in your chest you know you're just like that desire and I kind of stifle it because you don't know if you're I, I felt like like that's just a far away dream that you can't really actually achieve and it's just a what if like it's just a far away thing and um but it wasn't until I had my I was pregnant with my second child that I actually started writing and that the reason I started writing was because I read Twilight by Sophie Meyer and I thought well if she can do this I think I can do this too you know might as well start actually writing I attempted one book in college and it was a it was a hot mess and um I think I got like three chapters in and I realized I am really bad at this I don't know why I'm doing this this is horrible and I never told anybody until like years later that I tried to write a book in college and not even my husband <laughs> and we went to college together. He didn't even know. <laughs> um, but then after reading Twilight, I decided to finally just sit down and do it. And um, I drew from um, my inspiration from all those books that I'd read in the past. And I wrote some paranormal, I wrote some contemporary, I wrote some fantasy and just all over the place. But yeah, those are the books that really influenced me um, and really shaped um, my writing um, uh, as I grew older and and made me the writer that I am today. Thank you. Uh, Karuna, you're up next. So actually like um, Prerna and I have had like similar reading journeys, which is really interesting. Um, I've, I've been trying to like organize my thoughts because I'm a notorious rambler. Um, I have been seriously writing and loving writing since probably around three or four years old. I was homeschooled. Um, my mom really encouraged and always encourages my love of my writing. Um, so like when I was like five, I wrote this picture book and it was called The Girl and the Rabbit Who Liked Carrots. And it's literally the short picture book and we still have it. It's like hand bound, my mom bound it made a cover for it and everything and inside is my little stick drawings and my little you know like writing like this girl sees a rabbit in her yard oh my god it's hungry I'm going to give it carrots gives it carrots the end very very fascinating stuff um so I already liked writing I don't know like you know if at the time I took it that seriously but I also was very much known for being re um like a voracious reader um, to the point that like, you know, a lot of people would be like, why she's so quiet, how is she going to be able to do anything she's just reading. Like, you know, if you gave me a book and sat me down somewhere you wouldn't see me again like you know I would not raise my head and say anything I would just stay there. Um, so that was like a big part of who I was like all my friends in my like you know friend circles I was the one who read a lot. Um, I read Ellen Enchanted, I think in like fourth grade and that was the book like of all the books that I had read that year that I followed my mom around the house and I literally narrated and then this happened and Ella did this and oh my god he finally proposed oh my god like you know this happened and you know like oh my god it ended ha happily and I told her the whole story like with different voices and hand puppets while she was trying to like live her life and do her business and everything um you know but at the end like since she was homeschooling me she gave me like an A plus for a reader report and I think that was a moment where I was just like yeah I think I could do something like this and I used to have this floppy disk especially when I was in middle school that had like a hundred unfinished novels on it and whenever I read something especially in fantasy that really like excited me and intrigued me I would try to start a story and see if I could like you know like maybe I can play around with dragons maybe I can play around with a prince under a curse and um never really finished any of them um and then when I was in high school several things happened my library started a teen writing club that I got involved in um you know I started learning more like my best friend started a book blog so then I started book blogging that's what kind of brought me like semi-formally into the publishing world and like learning more about books um and I read two really formative books one was Howl's Moving Castle and um Howl's Moving Castle was really really like 
is still one of those titles that I fundamentally consider like had totally changed my like view and was like, yes, I'm definitely writing. I love fantasy. I love YA. This is where I need to be. Um, and my cousin actually had the sequel to House Moving Castle. She didn't know I'd read it. She had it also for high school. And I saw it at her house and I was like, can I read that? And she was like, sure. And she just gave it to me. And, you know, even as like, um, I don't know if anybody's read the sequel or not, but it has like, you know, this Middle Eastern sort of like Aladdin-ish world and this like prince named Abdullah and he wants this princess. And, you know, there's a lot of stereotypically like Desi and like Arab stuff like mashed together, um, you know, in a way that doesn't hold up now. But that time I was kind of just like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. Like she looked at like, you know, our cultures and she thought that there was something neat about it. And it was like, you know, now I'd just be like, oh my God, girl, please, this is like the bare minimum. But like, you know, then it was just kind of like, okay, like for years I've thought that people like me weren't interesting and weren't like, did not make it into fantasy narratives. And then <clears throat> I'm, um, I'm black and Asian. So like on the black side of the family, my grandma was always giving me books where like they were always telling us about slavery. So it was kind of just like, okay, so you all are in contemporary, like, you know, issue sort of books, but you can't make it into fantasy and you definitely can't have these sort of, like, sort of happy endings where people are caring if you get the princess or not. So that was kind of really formative. And then I got into Twilight. And when I got into Twilight, that really changed everything because I actually wrote fan fiction. I was part of like the fandom community. And that was, and a lot of um, people I knew from Twilight actually became YA authors who are also published. Some went into like even like adult romance and stuff. So that was like another step towards, okay, this is seriously where you need to be. This is your community. This is where you're going to stay. And I ended up, you know, kind of um, staying in there. Um, but I still feel like I'm kind of coming into like a book coming of age, because like I said, for years, my mom used to tell me to write about someone who looked like me. For years, I had that internalized erasure from the industry that was making me feel like, no, maybe people like us aren't interesting. Maybe it's not going to like, you know, sell. Um, you know, so I feel like in 2014, when We Need Diverse Books happened, I was like the youngest member on the team, thanks to Ellen O and Aisha Sayed kind of dragging me on and saying, no, you can be part of this. You want to volunteer, like totally come in. Um, and that was really life changing for me. Um, seeing like, for instance, especially Aisha, who is another Desi Muslim author who had just gotten her age and just gotten a book deal. It was kind of just like, okay, you're surrounded now by women of color who are doing what you want to do. This, like, this is not a mistake. This is real. This can happen for you. And so I feel like ever since I've started to finally see, like, you know, the representation that like, you know, the girl who grew up on Diana Wynne Jones and Gail Carson Levine, who needed those kind of like, you know, strong feminist narratives you know, from these authors who really did do their best to try and be respectful with what they knew at the time. But like, you know, I'm really seeing that now those narratives that I actually kind of, you know, would have really appreciated and needed, including my own. Um, and I'm about to cut myself off because I can feel myself rambling. But um, one story I want to share from my first year of teaching that really shook me and really made me realize, like, you know, like how sometimes you can kind of like, I know all of us as writers, we have our self doubt moments and like, it's easier to compliment our friends instead of seeing our own importance. And so I'm always like one of those people who's like, oh my God, like, you know, Shoretta is so cool. And like, you know, like um, Swathi is so cool. And like, you know, my friends are so cool. And what am I doing? Um, and so I was teaching, I was a seventh grade homeroom teacher my first year teaching in 2017 right out of college and um one of my good friends was teaching fifth grade homeroom so like you know we were like teacher buddies like if we needed something we would go up and ask the other so she sent two of her fifth graders to my classroom I'm teaching and like you know they're like oh like you know um our teacher said we you would give us some scissors we need some scissors we're doing craft time I was like oh sure like you know let me look in my drawer and so I was looking in my drawer I was telling my kids to like knock it off whatever they were doing and just like focus because of course like you know strangers in the room let's get noisy and so like you know I was only half listening to them because I was like okay these two kids are under my guard right now so I better like make sure they don't do anything and one of them was like is that the author teacher is she the author teacher yeah I think she is are you the author teacher I was like yeah I, I don't even go to you all's floor like how do you all know who I am they're just like oh we heard from one of the older kids that um their teacher is the author teacher whose book just came out which was like you know really like I got home and I just like kind of cried and I was like that is so sweet and it's so nice that these kids are just like so happy to see an author that looks like them that wrote a book with a kid that looks like them and like you know it's it's going to 
hopefully come to a point where they're just going to expect that it's not going to be a shock it's going to be absolutely you know I deserve to be there and you know these are the type of books I grew up on which is going to be really cool yeah I love that story the author teacher yeah we had a teacher in our school who's author and author but I think that she wrote romance because she would never tell us what her author name was <laughs> all right uh next up is Swati yeah um I started out as a reader, first and foremost. Um, I would read literally everything that was put in front of me. I did not discriminate whatsoever. I would read like the back of shampoo bottles. I don't know. Um, and that led to me, and even now being a reader who has always loved a, a plethora of genres, but fantasy is, is where I really started falling deeply in love and feeling like maybe I could do this too. And so I think there was really, three books if I had to pin it down it's hard because for the longest time being a reader was I also didn't realize authors were real people <laughs> I was like oh this like fantasy entity creates these things I love these stories that I'm obsessed with um like one anecdote is I was I was that kid who would go to dinner parties and would have a book and then an extra book <laughs> And then my mom would always be like, what are you doing? I go socialize, like have make friends. But um, yeah, I, I read everything, but like fantasy is where I first kind of fell in love with this con concept of story and, and the, the idea of writing the new worlds and being able to adventure in them. And so it's really, um, I would say it's Tamara Pierce's Tortal series. That was the first time I saw a, a girl who was just like badass and wielding a sword and, and taking, you know, charge of her own destiny. She was angry. She was strong. She was, you know, loyal. She was all these different things. And I fell in love with that series and I fell in love with a lot of Trabant in, in particular, that character. So this is when I, I think I was like 10 or 12 and I wanted red hair and purple eyes like her. Cause I was like, that's the only way I can also be a cool sword wielding magic magical like warrior I didn't even realize what the problem was with that statement in my head for a, a long long time actually it wasn't until years later when I actually found born confused um that it was the first time I really saw myself in a book and and that started like that turned on a little light bulb a little switch I think in my head and actually funny story my boyfriend is not gonna be happy that I'm talking about this but when we uh were talking about the books that we thought were really formative and that we loved he mentioned that um his copy of Born Confused like the cover fell off because he would pass it around to all his friends <laughs> and everyone was reading it and it was it was so important and huge so I would say that's my second book um, and then the third book really was much later. I, I had always kind of written, I actually did a lot of poetry in high school and I was, I wrote short, really darkly comedic plays in middle school. I don't know why <laughs> they were really not that funny. Um, but I thought they were hilarious and I didn't try writing a novel until much later. I wrote a lot of fan fiction, all these different things. Um, it wasn't until in my like twenties when I, I read An Ember in the Ashes it was the first time I saw brown characters in leading roles in a fantasy series. And that was the first time I actually really thought, maybe I could do this. Maybe I can create my own world and, and put characters in there that I've always wanted to see. And not just do that, not just have them be you know, vaguely brown, but to go like all in and, and capture the, the feeling and the storytelling of the the myths and the folklore that I grew up with I knew that I wanted I would have loved to have that as a kid I used to like read like Amar Chitrakada and all these different comics and I just like I wanted a little more of that in every fantasy I was reading so it was it was kind of a journey it took me a long time to get to the point where I was like I can do this and I can actually share this with other people um but yeah I mean I think that's a, those are the three books. I mean, there's so many more, but those are the three books that really kind of changed everything for me. Thank you. All right, Shweta. Okay, my answer is going to like diverge wildly from everybody else's because I don't really have formative books. Anyway, one did because it's more like I'm just this book devouring monster and they all come together inside me and make something new later, right? So what I'll say instead is that I've always, from the time I was tiny, the early I can remember, I've always carried 
really rich imaginary worlds inside me. And in, in fact, when I was younger, I used to be able to feel magic in the air. And I hope that comes back one day because that was really amazing. And, uh, and, it, and it, I think it helped too in a sad way that I you know, was bullied and I didn't really have any friends. So it was easy for me to just also be the person my parents got mad about it. And, and uh, I remember I would just naturally make up stories and I didn't even know that's what I was doing. You know, it's just, that was, that was just a thing I would just imagine. And, and I've always been very, very visual as if you, if you read any of my work, you see that in my description. So for me, that's just natural. And then I remember I had written a story about a silver, a unicorn with a silver horn when I was, I want to say in sixth, fifth or sixth grade, sixth grade, I think. And I was so excited because it placed only in the very first round of this competition. And I took it home to my parents and they gave me the day series. They were like, you can't make any money doing this. And I was like, I just wanted to say that I, my story got like in a competition and you know, the total typical day series. But uh, um, anyway, apparently I am making money doing this. So sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I would, you know, I would just, I would fill myself up with, with all these stories. And like, um, like Swati mentioned, Mertitra Kata was a huge thing. These comic books that I grew up with, where we learned a lot of our, our stories from like the Mahabharata and, and uh, other epics and, you know, Hindu stuff and just, and I, and it, it just, yeah, that, that all sort of melded together inside me and made something new. And so I, if I had to pick formative books, obviously, like I said, The New Does Born Confused got me thinking. Uh, Holly Black's Tithe also did, because after I read that, I was like, huh, I want to do something like that, like the Indian version of this. Uh, Holly uses, you know, fairy folklore, and I wanted to do the equivalent. And that was my attempt with my first novel that ended up getting trunked, which had Nags and Garud, which is actually in my, my second book, the one I'm desperately trying to revise in the right now. <laughs> but uh, that yeah just thinking about all those things that I wanted and but but yeah now that I think about it, in high school too uh, I don't know if any of you read like Dragon Lance and the Forgotten Realms the Forgotten Realms were my thing uh, like I yeah so I tried writing I was like I'm gonna write one of these books and I wrote like a chapter and I sent it to them and I got this really nice like detailed rejection letter but you know I was a kid so I was in high school so I was like eh, they didn't want my book whatever and I didn't understand like somebody respected me enough to treat me like an adult even though I wasn't one and tell me what didn't work that's amazing like today that's you know but I didn't know that anyway so I think after that I kind of, and I also wrote in high school like 35,000 words of fan fiction of people around me it was like this weird fantasy thing and with me as a heroine but I remember thinking the same thing that I've heard other brown and black writers say that they felt like the only way you could have these stories is if you wrote white characters like and and I don't know why I knew to write myself and maybe because I was writing like fan fiction of real life and also I remember writing fan fiction of The Legend of Zelda because I had a huge crush on Link and I wanted to be in there too. So I wrote myself out, amazingly as a brown girl with a soul over Triforce. And uh, and also my sister and I wrote a Street Fighter fan fiction. Like we were writing this novel together about the Street Fighter video game. <laughs> like, just really random stuff. And then I, you know, I quit writing, like writing, writing for a while, but I never stopped imagining or telling stories because that was just uh, what I do naturally, just imagining. and. And so the, it was only, but then finally, when I was in my mid twenties and looking around, like I said, then I realized, hey, where are the stories about people who look like us? And that's when I decided to start doing this seriously. But, but yeah, so that was, that was my, my strange journey. And I honestly, I like it though. I like that I don't have any particular canon, whether, you know, that anyone thinks we're supposed to have read Night Tempest of the books that if you are, you know, if you are properly educated in science fiction and fantasy that you have read these things. And I haven't read a lot of them and I don't care. Like, I feel like my stuff is fresher because of that, so. Yeah, I don't, I have, I've never read Lord of the Rings. I've never read Asimov and I don't care. Uh, so this next question, um, I wanna actually uh, start with Karuna only because you uh, answered it a little bit, which is um, talk to me about like the first person or the first people to really encourage or foster or help you develop your creativity and um are they still around in your life um yeah honestly my mom um who still reads rough drafts of stuff and um you know is honestly one of my tougher critics um because she reads a lot of my middle grade and YA stuff and she's also like 
um, love books. And one of my favorite stories is still like whenever we go to Books of Wonder um, in the city, um, she will be like, oh, when I was um, pregnant with you, I came to Books of Wonder and look, now you do appearances here. Isn't this amazing? And it is true. She went to Books of Wonder um, and her and my dad walked around and browsed the children's books because they love children's books even then. Um, so I would say my mom definitely, um, you know, put a lot of like, you know, faith in my writing and a lot of encouragement, um, you know, which I'm always and still am very, very grateful for. I'm very grateful that if I'm having a tough time as I do recently, um, I'm in Hamlin University's um, Masters of Fine Arts and Writing for Children and Young Adults program. So, um, you know, we have packets that are due like once every month, pretty much during the semester and packet um, crunch time, which is what I'm in right now, is very, very stressful. So sometimes when I have to bounce something off, I just literally go and just go, Mama, da -da -da -da, this is happening. Ah. And she's like, okay, calm down. You wanted to do this. You're doing fine. Why are you complaining? Here, give me a hug. Take some chocolate. Go and sit back down and finish it. You know, it won't get done, which I'm grateful to have her to, you know, kind of bounce off. Um, I'm also just... Um, I'm trying to think who else, like my two best friends who I'm still best friends with from middle and high school. Also like, especially my um, my very best friend who I bounce stuff off WhatsApp daily. And we did like a, we did a, a deep dive into emails the other day. And I actually had found like, which is really embarrassing. When I read Twilight in high school, I started writing this YA um, vampire romance series. And she was one of the friends who show, I showed it to. I also showed it to my cousins, which was a mistake because every single thing, whether it's it, whether it's like some other like family event, they will bring up that like YA series and they're like oh whatever happened to those characters what happened to them and you're like just in not a very supportive but like kind of poking fun way um but in a loving way still but you know like i had sent her this whole email with the draft and she wrote back these comments and she's like this is so good and i was just like the cringe is killing me of both of us right now <laughs> looking at this and being excited about it but um yeah, I definitely think like, you know, my mom and my friends around me in terms of authors, Ellen O oh and um, Aisha Syed and um, Saba Tahir um, were very, very influential. Shweta um, came in very early on and saw something good in me and was very much like, you know, keep at it and, you know, do your best with it. Um, Sona and Danielle, who also run Cake Literary, um, you know, I, I was very fortunate when I came into the business. I I feel very blessed that I was quickly surrounded by a lot of women of color because I'm not sure where I would be if I didn't have those people, you know, to bounce things off, whether it was friends or mentors or like, you know, sort of supportive figures. Um, you know, like, I feel like I've been kind of lucky in the women that I've like, you know, um, been introduced to in the industry in general, but especially the women of color have always like, you know, had my back and I'm very grateful for that. And I try my best to, you know, pass that onward as well. It's a very familiar story that I hear from a lot of women of color, which makes me really happy. It's it's always nice when we're like really supportive of each other. Uh, Shrato, why don't you go next? Uh, that I was actually hoping you would pick me next because I wanted to say uh, or address a couple of things that Karuna said. First of all, her mother is really, really lovely. I've met her and she's so she's so sweet and yes, uh, she's very lovely. And also, it's been wonderful, you know, because I did end up mentoring Karuna, like. Like she said, we met when she was, you know, younger, and watching her. So, and, and I remember we had conversations. Where I was like, "You realize you don't need me as a mentor anymore. Like, this is so great. Just watching you come into your own, and you know, and like figuring out what you want and what you want to say. And that's been really lovely. And so, yeah, I totally agree with the whole idea of, you know, women of color supporting one another. We, if we're not going to do it, who is? So, but for me, the funny thing is, I don't really think I had that really when I was younger that I had anyone except maybe my English teacher in high school who thought I might, you know, be that I might have, I don't know, become a science writer or something. Like I don't, there was nobody who was really supportive. So now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know. I, I guess I was just really bullheaded because I was, just, I just decided I was going to do this. And even though everybody was telling me, don't bother, you know, like my, everybody who's like, oh, you can't make any money at this. The people who were telling me no one will read a book like, you know, who will, no one will pay for a book like this, just self-publish. And the whole industry saying that for a while that it didn't, you know, know what to do with our stuff. But I guess I was just really determined because I, for whatever reason, I just kept going and I would mentally flip people the middle finger when they were like, no, you know, what, why are you bothering? No one cares. And 
so yeah, that, that's, that sounds really sad, but it's not because I can still give that mentorship to other people that I didn't get. So, so that's my short answer. Cool. Swati, how about you go next? Yeah, actually I have a, a fairly similar story. I was, was really thinking hard. And while my parents were really great about fostering a sense of creativity as a child, um, it was much more of a general idea of like, you need to be accomplished. So learn some of these things. And, and I took to them. So, you know, I was, I sang, I danced, I played instruments, I drew, and I was never really told like, oh, you shouldn't do that. But I wasn't necessarily encouraged, mostly because I think my parents just didn't know what to do with it. I was more creative than what they were used to. And, you know, when I would talk to them about their art or the things that they used to love, um, there was always a point where they stopped doing it. Uh, but they grew up, you know, so to speak, and they left their creativity behind. And so at first, that's kind of what I did. Um, I actually think it took me so long to start taking my own writing seriously because I didn't, I had, didn't see anyone else who had ever done something like that. I... I do think that I kept a lot of my like writing and stuff secret because I just, I didn't give it, I didn't give it the belief it needed. And it was hard because I wasn't getting that from anyone else. And that's really not supposed to be like a sad story. It just like, it is what it was. But then when I, when I did kind of realize that creativity is, it was the thing that made me happy. I was, you know, working, I was in the corporate world it fulfilled a part of me, but I knew there was like more that I wanted to be doing. And it was for the first time in my life, I hadn't I didn't have any sort of creativity. I was on a dance team in college. I was, was always doing something. And I went back to my first love, which is reading and writing. And once I kind of got the ball rolling for myself, I found sources of support for my family and friends that maybe I myself kind of assumed they wouldn't be there to be as supportive. Um, but it wasn't really until like, I actually joined Twitter, honestly. And I met this you know incredible YA community that I started to meet other people who knew how to help me foster my own creativity, if that makes sense. You know, they're supportive in the right way, critical in the right way, um, help me get better. And I learned so much from all those people. Uh, I mean, I writers are just incredible. So I would really say, I don't have one, not, I didn't have really have any one person in my childhood, but I've been fortunate enough to find a lot of those people along the way. That's awesome. I'm sure that's true for a lot of people. Uh, Prerna, how about you go next? Hi, so I am fortunate enough that both of my parents are pretty um, supportive and have always been pretty supportive of their kids being creative, um, which is not necessarily like the stereotypical Daisy parents, <laughs> but uh, uh, my mom was also a poet herself growing up and her dad, my grandfather, was also um, also a poet and wrote poetry. Um, and um, fostered a love for reading. His his dad fostered a love for reading with and his all of his grandchildren, and so that um, uh, definitely influenced my mom as she was growing up. And um, uh, she still talks about like the songs I used to write. Um, but when I first started writing, I would write in my journals when I was um, after I got married, and she found my journals when she came to help me take care of my second, uh, second born child. And she was just like, Oh, what are, what are these? Like they were, cause they were all over my house. <laughs> because I just, that was how I started writing. I was, just, I needed to have a notebook and um, she started reading them and she was like, Oh my gosh, this is really good. But she didn't tell me that she had found them because she didn't want to like discourage me or freak me out. Cause I hadn't told her at that point. Um, but she was very excited for me. And my dad um, has always been very encouraging and he, to this day, we'll talk about how he was called to a teacher conference when I was in elementary school and how the teacher kept telling me, kept t- t- telling him, oh, wow, Prerna, she wrote this short story and it's so good and she's such a good writer. And like, it makes him, he's very uh, uh, proud of <laughs> the fact that I went on to become a writer. So I've, I definitely had um, very encouraging parents um, and they're um, still very, very supportive and love to hear updates about things that are going on and so it's very exciting for them too. Um, and, um, and then my husband is very encouraging and my kids, now that they're older, they're also like, I was, I was I, the other day I came up with this pitch for this new story and I shared it with my 12 year old and he read it and he was like, this is really good. I really like it. What do you, you know, what happens next? Like, tell me what happens. And so it's, ex- it's exciting that I have I've been very lucky and fortunate that I've had family and friends who have, um, encouraged me and my mother-in-law, even my husband's mom, um, 
uh, is um, very much a cheerleader as well. And so I, I'm very lucky and I, I appreciate how encouraging they are. And sometimes it kind of feels a little bit too much because you're like, you don't want to fail. You don't, you know, don't want to let them down. All these people who have been encouraging for all these, all these years, you want to like succeed for them as well as yourself. And, but um, yeah, I'm just glad that I was, I, I had them to help me to push me forward because I don't know if I could have done it without that uh, encouragement. Well, that sounds so nice. It must be nice to have little people around who are like, I want to read it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're really cute. They're very good cheerleaders. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Tanaz. So uh, for me, it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, For my parents, they would always encourage my love for reading. So uh, like Karuna, I would be that kid. If I found a book, I'd go into a corner somewhere and you wouldn't find me in the house. You know, I'd I'd be there reading a book in the corner. And so they would take me to the bookstore. My dad would encourage me to buy encyclopedias and I would take the money and instead buy like tons of novels and, you know, load up a cart full of those. And in terms of like, you know, in just the writing part they were like oh she's writing you know and so like Swati I have that trajectory where I thought that you know no one wanted me to be creative Um, but the funny part was that my friends in school they kind of knew what I was good at so um, I had this uh, little um, bit of a phase where I thought I wanted to be a cartoonist and like my friends were putting together this magazine and I'm like oh I've drawn these cartoons they looked at it and they're like no write something for us instead I'm like okay and then I wrote this ridiculous poem which started with my class is full of lunatics you can't blame it for that or something like that and then uh that they published that they're like yeah this is great this is perfect for our class I'm like okay so that's when I knew that okay so whenever I write something people want me to write stuff but there was a long period where I was uh, uh, in university. I was studying for a BCom, and I didn't write for four years. And literally, when I graduated university, I was not feeling very happy about the way I was going in terms of my career. I'd done a BCom. I was supposed to go and become a CA, but you know, I was not happy during the networking session. So I talked to my parents, and I said, that, "Okay, if you want me to get a CA, I will get a CA. But then later on, I'll." write books and that's when my it clicked for them and they're like so why are you doing all this why are you doing this degree you know just do something that you want to do and uh, so I started working full-time in an export company and I also applied the for a creative writing by correspondence course in Humber College in Toronto and uh, literally I just wrote a short story and I just sent it in I thought I'd never get accepted I got accepted and that short story became my very first novel 10 years later so that was my trajectory and my parents till this day are my biggest cheerleaders in fact uh, my dad and I we go on power walks and I'm I'll be like bouncing off ideas with him and then he'll be like because he doesn't like to read but he he's very logical and he'll be like there's a plot hole here there's a plot hole here and then he like you know poke holes through all my work and then I'll be why did I talk to you he's like because I can tell you this (laughs) and so that was the fun that's the fun part about being with my dad but in terms of my friends when I told them in university that okay I'm probably not going to be a CA I'm going to start writing books and they're like finally something is going right with you. I'm like, okay, so maybe I was in the wrong career path. Thank you. And so my friends are still with me. They like, they're the first people to buy my books when they come out. And they're like, right now, my friend is like asking me a hundred questions about Hunted by the Sky. And she's like, okay, is this person a ghost? I'm like, no, that person has cataracts. They don't, they're not a ghost. So it's, it's that kind of thing. You know, we're, we're constantly online and talking to each other. So I've been lucky in that aspect um, that I still have these people with me. That is great. <laughs> Tanisha. I took a moment, sorry about that. <laughs> um, similar, similar story as well with my, uh, with my family. So my father and mother and, and brother also have been super supportive since I was little and they are always the ones who like had, have had no doubt when I've been racked with self-doubt and that, con- you know, that continues to this day to some extent <laughs> as well. Um, so, you know, the, the books that I've written so far as well, like one of the, the driving kind of catalysts 
behind creating these stories was to also, you know, honor them and their story and everything they sort of did to, to come here and support our dreams and, you know, pursue the American dream, which we are all pursuing desperately <laughs> in many ways now too. Um, so yes, so they're thankfully still in my life. They're actually living with us now, which is wonderful. So we, we moved back from the UK um, to Maine, well, to Massachusetts initially to be closer to my parents because they're in their 80s and it's getting hard for them to travel. And my brother is in Maine and he can't move easily because of his work. So we came here and then we lured them here and managed to like all move in together by the end of March. So that had been the plan and it just so happened to be right when the pandemic hit as well. So it, it was a, a relief and a blessing on many, 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 many levels. It is a relief and a blessing. So yeah, so my parents and my, my brother, um, when I was in New York, like basically I also like after, when I was a kid, I thought I wanna be an author. So therefore I'm going to be an author. So like, that's just how it's gonna be. And then there were just so many years of insecurity later. I mean, not so much when I was in school, I think I was still doing some creative writing and you know, busy with that. But once I came, came out into the world, um, I just was, I was exhilarated, I was confused, I was lost, I was enjoying aspects of the lostness, and I was feeling really like, um, what story can I possibly tell? Like, do I even have a story to tell? And my brother, we overlapped in New York, um, and I did kind of, I, I had no career. I mean, I guess I've like never really had a had a career in, in the sense I was a dog walker. I was like, I worked in a, in a Tex-Mex restaurant. I was a secretary. Um, I did a lot of years of like copy editing and editing later, but it was always kind of like a hodgepodge of different things with this idea that that's my day job. And then I'm going to go back at night and, and I'm going to write that novel one of these days. But New York city has a lot of, you know, other compelling things going on. So it was very easy to procrastinate as well <laughs> in New York City. There are a lot of a lot of reasons, you know, not to go back to the apartment and sit down and and do that. But a, a big part of that was also just not knowing what to, what to do. And my brother, um, when we'd meet up, we'd sometimes like go running around the reservoir in New York, and he was constantly giving me pep talks and you know sort of saying you have to stop thinking of writing as a punishment. Try to reframe it and think of it as a reward. Think of it as, you know, he just, lots of things like that while I was, <sighs> I'm not much of a runner. So <laughs> he was also distracting me while we ran. And then, you know, he gave me, um, he gave me like my first Kate Bush album and Elvis Costello and, and Joni Mitchell's Blue, which is still one of my all time favorite albums. Um, he gave me his copies of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, um, Milan Kundera. We went to see like Water for Chocolate together on our rollerblades. We went to Cinema Paradiso. We went to see the Talking Heads documentary, Stop Making Sense, like at midnight somewhere in the East Village. And um, so he's he's been a huge musical and literary influence and just big, 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 big support. And it was just his birthday a couple of days ago. So happy birthday, Raj. And um, and so, yeah, so they, they've kind of been constant, you know, in terms of um, that support system. And they've come to, like my parents read my first drafts and, that's a commitment because they're long books and the first drafts were even longer. Like nobody sees the first drafts, but they managed to survive. <laughs> they even built some biceps and triceps while <laughs> lifting the papers. So they, they've read the drafts. They also will see like the, the little missing, missing bits or, you know, correct things or just sort of have suggestions and, and, um, and they've come to like the book launches and, and uh, my brother as well, and to um, gigs as well, because I was in I was in bands in New York, and then I was in a band when we moved to London, and then you know we did music performances connected to the albums I did for the books, and my parents were up there, they're at CBGBs. <laughs> Luckily, they didn't have to use the restrooms because that I don't want my parents to have to go through something. I don't want any of you to go through that ever. <laughs> so so that's the basic support system, and then I did have. Um, oh wait, and I have to do a shout out to my husband who, before he was my husband, wrote down writer in the occupation um, line when we were filling out our landing cards when we were going to France to meet his family. And he's got more legible writing, so he was filling out the form and then in occup occupation always would make me kind of start panicking. Whenever I have to like fill out what do you do, I'd be like, <laughs> is it the dog walker part or what, what do I put where? And I, I never wrote down writer and he wrote down writer and 
I can like still see that as well, the same way I could see those moments on Nancy Drew's pages. And there is something about that, just seeing it written down on this like official paper that also was a little moment in the journey to feeling like, oh, maybe I could start thinking of myself that way. Because you know, the typical, the typical thing that would happen on those rare occasions, I would say, I'm a writer, you'd automatically get like, oh, well, what have you published? Or how many, you know, and this is, this is when I was still trying to put together short stories and trying to figure all of that out. So that, that was a great moment. And um, I had some great teachers along the way when I was a child. And then later in those years in New York, um, this, this was a, a life changing experience in my um, writing path. I took a class at the Writer's Voice at the YMCA and I was taught by Kaylee Jones, who's an author herself and an incredible person. And that writers that that started to give me the structure to like have to deliver on these short stories and you know have a deadline and and you know choose to stay in and and I found I was really enjoying it. And something amazing that happened in um, throughout that process is I forgot to mention that up until this point, everybody I was not only writing about but imagining was white. So, you know, when I grew up, there were, as I was saying, like my parents were the first, we were the first family like us in our town. And there was nobody on TV. There was no one in magazines. There were, there was nobody in any movies. And on my childhood bookshelf, there was like just nobody who looked like us. And I, that also, I only realized when writing Born Confused, I, there was also nobody who looked like us in my imagination, like even in my wildest imagination, my daydreaming, you know, Shweta, I think that's amazing. You wrote your brown heroine in like that, you know, that it was like kind of a natural step for you to do that. I, I didn't realize till much later, I never saw us. I saw us here. I mean, this is, was overflowing with us, but I just didn't see, I didn't see us. I, I saw like versions of Charlie's Angels and <laughs> Judy Garland and, you know, Nancy Drew again, like, and even when I was, you know, I, even when I would draw, like I would, I invented, I also did like all, little songs and had some kind of embarrassing pop songs and things like that too. And when I would draw the um, bands, I had these index cards and I would draw the singers and the bands that I was making up and write their bios on the back. And they were always also like occasionally redheaded, um, but always very white and blonde and, you know, all, all of that stuff. So this, this is like a kind of maybe circuitous way to get there, but this in this writing workshop, I was writing these short stories and they, um, you know, I was just kind of going one at a time. And then about a year into the workshop, I think we, we broke off into like a smaller group of people who would meet at Kaylee, Kaylee's house. We were all working on kind of longer projects. And a couple of people in the workshop during one session with one story said, why don't you just make your protagonist Indian? And I was like, well, I think it was like Amy from Minneapolis where I've never been or so. I don't, you know, I don't remember who she was initially. And um, there were no people of color in my writing workshops and there were never people of color in my writing workshops actually. But um, a couple of people said that, like one of them said, why don't you just, one person said that protagonist seems to have a different perspective or like this scene in this room, it feels, something feels a little off. And then another person said, why don't you just make her Indian? And I literally like, I thought, oh my God, first I thought, what? And then I went home and I, I did a find and replace. <laughs> I went through these stories and I, I, changed, I changed the name. She became Kayla. I changed like where I made her East Coast. I gave her, I think a similar background, Gujarati Maharashtran. And it required very little else to, other than this find and replace and the changing of a few details. And then all of a sudden these stories became connected stories and possibly even a novel. And that just changed every, I mean, I'm not saying it was immediately easy after, but that was a huge breakthrough moment. And then um, a next breakthrough moment happened with another writer I met in that workshop who's, um, she's wonderful. She's um, Croatian American and she was writing that what ended up being that kind that story, the story of those cultures in her life. And we got really stuck. Like we we had kind of high moments together in this workshop and then we both hit writer's block kind of at the same time. And then we started sort of avoiding each other. We were really, really good friends, but <laughs> it became kind of painful when we'd see each other because, 
you know, it was the like, we used, we used to talk about everything we were working on and share stories and critique things. And then neither of us were getting anywhere. So you kind of didn't want to ask and you didn't want to tell. So, um, but then we were out one night um, in the East Village and it was late at night. And then I, I just, I, I told her, um, I just feel like I'm not Indian enough to write the Indian part of my story and I'm not American enough to write the American part of the story. Because I had gotten to a certain point with those connected short stories and I was like delving into kind of family history and anecdotes and stories about my parents growing up in Gujarat and in Bombay and, and then I just felt like I didn't know how to go further. And then um, Carmen looked at me and said, well, maybe that's your story. And that became Born Confused um, a couple of years later. So yeah, those are the people. There are many people, they're friends and people who like just, you know, keep you feeling loved and sane and in a safe space in so many ways. But that's kind of the first names that come to mind on the writing path. Mm, that was beautiful, thank you. Mm. All right, so we're getting towards the end here, um, but I did wanna ask one more question of you all. Um, and that is uh, of the most uh, either recently published or released work you have, or the thing that you're working on right now, um, what are the most direct influences that you can point to? And, you know, that might be like a person who inspired you um, or another piece of art or whatever it is, just basically like, how was this current thing that you um, have either just released or are working on born? Uh, and I want to start with uh, Swati. I was actually hoping you wouldn't pick me first, <laughs> but um, I, I do have an answer. Um, so the Tiger at Midnight trilogy, it's, it is a series about um, Kunal and Isha, a, a soldier and a rebel. And it basically, they're, they encounter each other one night and their lives are forever changed. Um, they're from opposing countries and, you know, they have just come to uh, the end of a conflict. And, but at the same time, there is just, there's a lot of conflict and tension that they still need to resolve. There's lies they've been told and in stories that they need to kind of unravel for themselves. And there's also this aspect of duty. Um, Kunal in particular is a soldier. He feels a very, very strong duty to his country, to his uncle, who was a general. Um, and that is kind of imbued into everything he does. I think actually that that aspect really came from my own my own background, just being Indian and, and coming to, you know, having my parents come to America and being Indian American, there's this idea of immigrant guilt. Um, so that was one kind of maybe not so fun <laughs> inspiration point. It's this idea of, you know, we're given this idea of duty and what is our duty to our past and to our family, to our community? Um, and how do we break away maybe from the stories that we've been told to then kind of carve out our own paths? That was one aspect. Um, the other aspect is, I mean, I love enemies to lovers romances. Uh, that was just the fun, you know, the really fun part. Um, the conflict, the tension, and there's, they're, you know, Kanal and Isha are just, read the first book, <laughs> uh, no spoilers, but there, it was so much fun to write. And it was a story I think that had always been kind of brewing in my head. How do you, like, what happens when you throw two very, very different people together? Um, and then of course, third, uh, so much of my inspiration came from Hindu mythology and Indian history in particular. So the history of ancient India back, I, I like agonized so much about like historical details in the beginning before I realized that like, it's okay. It's ancient, it's ancient India. There's not that many, um, like primary sources from that time period. So like, it's okay if I take like a little bit of creative license in a fantasy setting, but, um, kind of like Mauryan and pre-Mauryan era of, of Indian history was a really big inspiration. Just kind of the, um, the political systems, kind of the, the types of conflicts, all these kind of kinds of things. Um, but also, like I said, Hindu mythology. So, all the stories of these ancient, super noble and dutiful warriors. And that's what I grew up on. I grew up watching all those, um, you know, like the episodes of the Mahabharata <laughs> with my, you know, my mom and my dad and my grandmother. Um, so it was just kind of amalgamation of all these things that I really, I'm not, so I'm not really sure if I can point like one, one thing. It just all kind of came together, I think. And it had been building up inside of me for a long time. That sounds about right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Prerna, how about you tell us what, what your influences are? 
Um, I have so many influences. <laughs> well, I guess I'll talk about the, uh, the specifically the projects I'm working on right now. Um, one of the things is like we've talked about how um, we've just discussed how we, it took us, I think, each of us a while to write characters that look like us and have our experiences. And um, my characters, um, I didn't grow up like in a traditional Indian household. Like I don't know, I'm not familiar with the Hindi mythology. My parents, um, we converted to a, a very white Christian religion when I was in elementary school. And so like I had a very different upbringing. And so a lot of my characters um, reflect that. And so sometimes like I, um, I also don't feel like in, I'm Indian enough to write these characters. <laughs> um, um, but I do it anyway, because I've you know, readers need every single aspect of, you know, each of our stories, because we all have such uh, different backgrounds. And that's what's, what makes our writing and our story so beautiful. But with my current stories, um, what in inspired me directly like, with, with my pitch that I'm working on right now, um, Hocus Pocus, <laughs> um, and Casper, and um, a little bit of practical magic. So those are the things that are, are I'm working with right now in this story that I'm I wrote a synopsis for and um and it's been fun and um and then the other book that I finished that I'm um on sub with um it was inspired by my relationship with my husband um and it's about a girl who breaks up with her long-term long-term boyfriend to figure out who she is like outside of her romantic relationship and um my husband and I have been together since high school and so it was very much like how it it um, kind of explores how people change um, in a relationship and how we kind of have to have to adjust um, uh, together and give each other time um, for that change. And so that was a, a big influence in um, in that particular story. But I draw an, an inspiration from whatever and anything and everything. And um, whether it's you know related to being Indian or if it's you know, pop culture, it's whatever it is. Um, I just um, inspired by so many, so many things. So yeah, uh, those are the main uh, influences in the, my current project. Thank you. Shweta, um, I know that you have told the story many times about how Star Daughter uh, was inspired by Neil Gaiman's Stardust, uh, but what about the book that you are working on now that's coming out next? That's actually a better question because I was going to say, I think I already answered it even here. So um, that so with, so I'll backtrack a little bit. When I was writing my, well, I should say the one that got trunked, it was called Eklavia Stam originally. And for those, you know, for anybody who doesn't know the story from the Mabharat, it stars, I mean, it, it's a huge, it's the biggest epic in the world. So like there are a lot of characters and a lot of nested stories, but the, but I would say like the main five are the Pandav brothers. There are five princes and they get taught by, a guru, a teacher named Dronacharya, and he, one day he took them out into the forest and he asked each of them, what do you see? And they all, all four of them said, oh, I see the trees, I see blah, 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 you know, I see the whole forest. Only Prince Arjun said, I see the eye of that wooden bird. And Drona said, okay, you are going to be my archer because you know what to aim, to look at what to aim for. And meanwhile, so they started training uh, Arjun. And meanwhile, this prince from a lower caste named Eklavia also approached Drona and said, I would like to learn archery as well. And Drona laughed at him and said, you know, you're not worthy of my time. And Eklavia went home, but he didn't get dissuaded. He made a clay statue of Drona. And so he actually became an even better archer than Urjun to the point that he could shoot an arrow into, or was it seven arrows? I forget however the, you know, the, all the stories change. So but have variations, but basically he could shoot an arrow into a dog's mouth to silence it if it was barking without actually hurting it. And, you know, so, so his fame started to spread. And when Arjun heard, he got very upset because he liked being number one. So he complained to, to Guru Dorna and I went to Eklavia and said, so I hear that you, you know, you've learned from me, you became this great archer. And Eklavia was just like, oh yes, you know, Guruji, that's so amazing. I, I you know, I'll do anything what, to thank you. And, and uh, Dorna said, okay, I want my Guru Dakshina. And that's the, the payment that you would owe your teacher. And Eklavia said, of course, of course, ask me anything. I will give it to you. I'm so thankful. And Dorna said, give me, cut off your right thumb so that you can, you know, he could never be an, an archer again. 
and Eclavier had to do it. So I had this really creepy idea of this uh, this bar that served really wild, fun, magical drinks in set in Phil uh, an alley in Philadelphia, and it was called Eclavier's. Um, it actually had the thumb in a jar, and it was bleeding, and that's really yeah, <laughs> dark and creepy. But it also starred uh, the the ongoing war between. Eagle shifters and the Na, their cousins, or snake people, snake shifters, and uh, and uh, so again that I like I said, and I ended up trunking that, but I loved so much of the of the original idea that I ended up taking for this book that I'm working on right now, and I'm I'm not allowed to say what the name is yet because it got to winter 2022, and I don't know when we're announcing it or sharing the cover or anything, but uh, but it 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 definitely has the uh, nags in it, and it has dreams by stories that I you know, knew growing up or learned as an adult, because that's the thing. I want to take a moment here to say that there's this really weird expectation put on marginalized authors that we're, our, our novels are supposed to teach people. I keep saying, seeing that reviews of my book, of, and, I'm, and I'm trying not even to look at reviews, but when they, when I get tagged in or other people's, it's like, oh, I'm so excited to learn about this culture or whatever. I'm like, but novels are not textbooks and you don't know what we have changed. You don't know what we have made up. And you wouldn't say this about a book by a white, why are you putting this burden on us? So yeah, so I, you know, I definitely went licensed to play with stuff. Like in Star Daughter, I made up the story about the star's tale of how diamonds came to be. That is not real or per you know, real as far as lore goes. And yet somebody might take it as real because it was written like a folk tale. And so anyway, so rant aside, I, you know, there's a lot I don't know, even if I was, you know, as the new desk title is, I'm a born, I'm an ABCD, an American born confused Daisy, like, you say. and, you know, and that, and yet there's this expectation that we're just supposed to know all this stuff. And so I don't, I'm just, I'm playing, I'm learning as I go along, you know, taking things that feel like they would be fun to play with or resonate to me and making up my own stuff. Like I said, I carry lots of imaginary worlds inside me. I love just really whimsical magic. I love, you know, my, my imagination will take disparate things and make put them together and make something new and uh so so all those you know so for example just there's going to be um like so this story takes place in Thuluk, which is the subterranean realm where the nogs live and uh and i you know and i read some descriptions in scripture of what how Nagluk is supposed to be splendid gore and yet i'm you know and I'm, so i'm i'm taking some of that but i'm also adding what i want to be there and what the story needs to be there and so I don't know, I, I find influence is actually a hard question to answer because again, I just sort of take everything in it, then just, you know, like the other day or I had to, I finally, after being in lockdown, I was like, I need a little break. So I treated myself to a little uh, writing retreat by the ocean last week. And and I went out one night, I had a book club, meet, a virtual book club meeting for a star daughter. But after that, I went out and walked alone on the beach and I just, you know, I was wearing my a long dress and it, and it, and I just let the, I was walking the surf barefoot and it just, you know, the, and the waves were coming in and uh, soaking hem of my dress and I started to imagine the surf as like this beautiful sari that the ocean was sending out and that it was trying to like, almost like it was trying to catch a ride, you know, the pearl, the, the beautiful silk of the unfurling sari would be the wave. And then the, the foam would like sea pearls lace and it just, you know, come to me and then they come together and, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to answer this question. So I'm to say. That's okay. That was a good answer. <laughs> Tanuja? That is so beautiful. That's a beautiful image. And also, we're creative, they sees. Redefining the sea. Conf confusion's good, too, because it's part of creativity, right? Because if you know everything, there's nothing to create. So... But anyways, I just wanted to throw that in. <laughs> um, for me, I think um, cities are very, very, very inspiring for me. So my my most recent book that's out is Bombay Blues, which is the sequel to Born Confused. So Born Confused, um, it's the story of you know the South Asian American um, character and her, and her family and her communities. Um, but it's also um, to me, it feels like it's a it's my love letter to New York City, and I had just moved from New York to London and I wrote it all in, in London, like right after getting to London. And when I was very close to um, finishing is actually when 9-11 happened, I was on a plane on the way back from London to the States to meet with my editor in New York. I mean, I was going to Boston, then New York. 
And um, I was actually writing a, a penultimate scene and I was trying to decide where to set it in New York. And I knew I wanted it to be by water. And I actually had not, I had World Trade Center question mark in the margin of the page I was writing in on the plane. And then of course 9-11 happened. And after that, like so many people, I didn't know what to do or how to write this story or you know, how could I write this story now without it being just about that? Or how could, you know, we were all, we were all and still are deeply wounded. Um, and my husband said, why don't you think of it as um, rebuilding the city that you love through your words and healing the city through your words and just let yourself go into that zone when you write. And, um, and that really, that's the thing that got me back into, you know, that, that last home stretch I had to do on the book. And there's a scene um, near the end where Dimple Lala's out with her camera in the meatpacking district. And my first draft of that, which, you know, I did really for myself, is like 30 pages of, you know, just an ode to every inch of the pavement and sidewalks and meatpacking, you know, coolers and rivers and, and corners and cross streets in, in New York. I mean, the, the final chapter is like 10 pages, <laughs> but, but um, that, that really helped me. And, and then I also realized that in, in a lot of ways, that's the story is about New York, about, about a New York that I, I lived there and um, kind of the world I found there, like the second generation South Asian um, art scene, like kids of the diaspora finding their voices in the, in the late 90s. And then Bombay Blues is, uh, it's kind of my, my love song to Bombay. And that the city also, you know, is a, was a huge muse. And I, I went to Bombay very naively, like Bombay, born confused, I wrote an outline and I sold it. And the final book is very close to the outline. Bombay Blues, I sold on an outline and day two in Bombay. And that outline was like out the window as I sat in traffic for like three hours, <laughs> trying to, you know, cover a distance that I thought was going to take 15 minutes. Like everything just went. And that, um, that whole experience, because I never lived in Bombay. After, I was a baby there, but not after that. Um, so that felt really like kind of a, a dance of, of my trying to like surrender to the city and sort of earn its trust and trying to work my way towards the city. And then as I'm sure you've all experienced at some point when you have enough momentum in your writing, you feel like your answers are coming to you. Like the city was kind of coming towards me, whatever, whatever the topic might be or the the muse that you're you're sort of working with, um, and the third in that in that series is largely based in the UK, and I and that would be you know a lot of it would be about London, and we've just moved back. What's interesting is I've never lived in the place that I've been writing about, and I kept thinking I was I didn't know we were going to move back, and I was thinking oh there's a third book set in London, but how am I going to write it if we're in London? And then lo and behold, we have moved. So that's, and, and now in Maine, the other story that's not part of the series, um, that feel, it feels very much like, even though it's not set in Maine in so many words, um, being around so much water, like we, we live in a town that has coastline and that's definitely the setting that we're in now, like where I'm living is definitely working its way into this story. So yeah, so cities and the people that make them up and, you know, the cultures that, that are created there and are embedded there and musical culture, a lot of art culture and music and street art and all of that too. So, yeah, and now that. of course, all of your work. So that's, that's something very exciting that we have, you know, all these like scribe sisters. And I just picture all of our characters are all hanging out in that big imaginary realm where we're all connected anyways, whatever we might be writing about, there's some, you know, there's another Zoom call happening somewhere else with all of them. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> so that that's okay, very. I that's definitely great. love that idea. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you, um, Corinna. Um, yeah, everybody said so many great things. Now I'm thinking. Also, I'm a very like um, Shweta knows this, but I'm a very like private person when it comes to what I'm actually like actively working on. Um, because I feel like if I talk too much about it, then I forget stuff or I start feeling like, oh, this is no good. So I always kind of try to keep it close. Um, but for the gauntlet, 
Um, you know, like the inspiration is pretty obvious, Jumanji. And what happened with that is that um, Zareen Jaffrey, who was then the head editor and the founder of Salam Reads, um, you know, got on this initial call with me where she was interested for the project. And um, Son and Danielle were also involved as it was a Cake Literary project. Cake Literary is a, um, you know, book packager that focuses on diverse books. I went from being their intern to their writer, all while being in undergrad, which was very overwhelming in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, like I was, I was very much in the days when this call was happening. But I remember, um, you know, like it was very clear that like, you know, um, first I did not want to write a middle grade, not because I don't love middle grade because I do, but because I thought I wouldn't be able to get that voice right. I love middle grade so much that I was just like, you know, maybe I will get the voice wrong. Maybe I'm too grown up from that now. Um, you know, and Son and Danielle struck this deal with me. I think it was probably Danielle, Danielle Clayton. She was like, okay, write five pages um, as a middle grade. If it doesn't work, we'll let you know. If it works, you, girl, you got to buckle down and you got to write as a middle grade, whether you like it or not. And so I sent them five pages and like, I think the email was one line. It was like, it works, get going. <laughs> like, you know, no, no excuses now. So Zareen was like, um, you know, like this is great and we we really want to like you know expand the story out with stuff that you love like you know like let's not make it just like a general fantasy adventure which was what the first few pages were kind of setting out as um it was kind of just like let's make it something specific what kind of specific fantasy adventure would you as a 12 year old young muslim girl have enjoyed and wanted to see yourself in, which was just overwhelming. Like this literally is the first book I wrote with a Muslim character and it's my first published book. So it was like kind of just like a groundbreaking call for me. And I thought, and I was like, what did I like at 12? And like, you know, the answer just kind of burst out of my lips, board games, Jumanji. Um, you know, like I was super into board games. Like we had a bunch of board games. Um, still to this day, whenever we try to keep the younger cousins from killing each other, like, you know, one of my older cousins will, or me as one of the older ones will be like, okay, let's play Monopoly. Let's, what well, Monopoly, you still try to kill each other, but let's play something where you all are not going to kill each other and, um, you know, like play nice for a bit. Um, so, you know, and I very much grew up on the Robin Williams version of Jumanji, loved it so much. So I was kind of like, let's do something like that with puzzles and, you know, with adventure, but let like, you know, but with like a Bangladeshi American girl getting to have this sort of experience. And you can see like, you know, where it kind of like, you know, it kind of has that inspiration, but I'm also proud that it took on, you know, what, what bothers me, like mechanical spiders, um, a scene that I had to write, you know, kind of literally with my hand over my eyes because I hate spiders, um, you know, like, you know, all the stuff involving sand and like, you know, all these type of foods in the, like, you know, in the sook that she and her friends like land at when they come into the board game, um, which again was another change because Jumanji came out, they go in, um, you know, like where there are all these foods that I grew up and like, you know, the different aunties that my mom was friends with would have like, you know, fed me. Um, so, you know, like I got to, you know, do something which I think is kind of an underlying theme in every project I sort of take on where I'm kind of just like, okay, this story where I didn't feel entirely involved in, um, what is a way that I can rework it and bring some of that like, you know, sort of people of color joy to it? Um, you know, what, what way can I start to really see myself into it? And I feel like my writing is like, you know, really shifting towards, um, you know, like different angles, different writing, um, you know, not just fantasy, I've had some contemporary ideas recently, which is kind of interesting, but overall is always coming back to what did you love when you were younger and how can you put yourself into it? So that's also kind of like where I'm kind of going from like, you know, just fully Desi characters to characters who actually look like me who are Blasian and are, you know, like having that Blasian experience. Um, and yeah, I think definitely, I think that's part of where my drive and love of retellings and like, you know, loving something then saying, how can I do something with this? It's kind of just like reclaiming it and like, you know, giving someone like myself a chance to have that adventure with that influence still there. That's awesome. I just, I love the idea also just like Jumanji, but make it better. <laughs> um, Tanaz, your last one. Okay, I just uh, wanted to say how much I love all of your answers. But first off, I, I just just 
I'm just filled with joy right now. I just I'm so happy to be on this panel. Um, in general, I think uh, for Hunted by the Sky, so the book is really about this girl whose parents are murdered by this tyrant king because he's hunting for girls who have a special star-shaped birthmark uh, because a girl with such a birthmark is, has been prophesied to kill him. And so basically, I just wanted to write a book with fierce brown warrior women who were wielding daggers and doing magic and also women with great, a great deal of political ambition you know women who had that ambition and who were not ashamed of um, you know expressing that and uh, so what I did was I looked toward Indian women who were bo both historical and modern for inspiration initially I started looking up a lot of midi in Indian medieval women one of them being Noor Jahan who was uh, uh, the wife of Emperor Jahangir, and she was one of the few Mughal queens who had her name and likeness on a coin, which is very rare. It never happened before. So she was absolutely fantastic. And she also hunted tigers. She rescued Jahangir when he wandered into an enemy camp. She just got all the elephants and the army together and like, okay, come on, let's get my hubby back. And that was hilarious. And uh, then there were the Atingal Ranis of South India, uh, Kerala, and those women used to lead their armies into battle. And, you know, even uh, Kerala has had a great history of a matrilineal society. And that's absolutely fantastic. Lots of powerful women there. In terms of modern women, I was really inspired by the Gulabi Gang of North India. So this is now a welfare organization, but it has vigilante roots. So these women would wear pink or Gulabi colored saris, and they'd go from village to village to rescue women who were undergoing abuse by their in-laws and things like that. And uh, that's where the rebel women group of my book, The Sisterhood of the Golden Lotus, was born. And Gulabi Gang is where my protagonist, Gul, gets her name. And uh, in terms of other things, like um, there was this painting that I wanted to talk about. It's by Payag, and it was painted in October of 1617, so about 403 years ago from today. And I'm going to describe the picture for you in it. In this, uh, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir is sitting in court and he's presenting a turban ornament to his son, Prince Khurram. And Prince Khurram, uh, to some of you, uh, you will know him by his other name, Shah Jahan, the builder of the Taj Mahal. And basically, this ceremony was specifically important because uh, Shah Jahan, he was being, uh, Khurram was being awarded a title of Shah Jahan, which meant king of the world. And because he came back from the Deccan having conquered a great deal of you know land and stuff for his father to expand the empire and this uh turban ornament was a symbol of transferring power or succession and this is something that really fascinated me about medieval kings and especially Mughal kings that how much emphasis they placed on jewelry and in fact and rubies and especially spinels which they call the balas ruby and what they do is that they'd engrave the names uh, of uh, each king or each emperor and they pass it down from generation to generation. So in my book, what I did was that I decided, okay, I'm going to use jewelry as a means of power. And so in the kingdom of Umber, firestones are a means of amplifying your magic. So if you're wearing a firestone ring, you can amplify your magic that way. And I also combined the idea of that with the turban pin and how power could be passed down, but also how it could be usurped. And I'm not going to talk more about that. You have to read the book to find that out. But yeah, it's mostly a lot of my art. Um, a lot of the art that I'm really into right now is music, especially Indian classical music for the next project that I'm working on. I'm also watching a lot of Ink Master. So maybe there's a tattoo inspired novel next. I don't know. We'll see how that works out or maybe it'll load into the fantasy realm somehow but uh, I've been watching this show on Amazon Prime called Bundish Bandits so it's this show where um, uh, there are two characters a boy and a girl who are on two different ends of the spectrum musically and in personality so the girl is a really famous pop star and she's into western music and the guy is from a really serious Indian classical background and he's you know very proper and prim and with Indian classical music there are lots of rules. You can't go into falsetto that is bad and stuff like that. So um, the romance of that show, 
a little bit iffy, but I really love the other relationships and especially the music that has been composed by Shankar, Esan, and Loy and lots of amazing classical music. Like I've been really inspired by Tan Sen, who was one of Emperor Akbar's courtiers and he was rumored to, you know, uh, have the rainfall when he would sing a particular rag. So the rag Meg Malhar for monsoons, he'd have make the rainfall. So that was kind of the, the sort of magic that I'm inspired by whenever I read these medieval stories. And by the way, Shweta, even people who are born in India are confused and don't know half of what's going on. Let me just tell you that straight off the bat. I've been doing these uh, events in India right now to promote the book. And my editor literally told me that even Indians living in India are writing white characters and submitting them in fantasy. So you can understand that we're all colonized. <laughs> so that is the, you know, that is our heritage. So literally, when I started writing this book, I'm said, you know what, I'm just going to put every Desi thing that I can think of in there. And I'm going to even put in Hindi and Sanskrit and a little bit of Farsi without really transliterating every single thing, you know, so I'm not going to go the non bread route. And if people get annoyed, too bad. There's a glossary at the back, by the way. That works. <laughs> so that... Tempest, if I can jump in really fast, because I do have something yes. to say about that. See, I didn't even do a glossary. And I I thought, I, my thought is we have had to understand the white story, whatever form it takes with, you know, and all the cultural references and all that. Like that's, a, that's supposed to be universal. So when I did Star Daughter, I was, uh, I, okay, again, I'm going to not swear. I was like, okay, no, we're not, screw that, we're not doing that. I want to write from the, you know, the point of view based on what I grew up as, the confused, you know, okay, I wasn't half a star, or was I? I won't tell, but the, you know, the, I, I will at least say I was, you know, caught between worlds in a lot of ways because, I, you know, I grew up in that small town I told you about, but also I didn't fit in with the Indian community because, you know, they thought I was very strange and the things that I was interested in were not we're not what we were supposed to like and the things that I wanted to do for you know just in life were not not Desi approved and so I wanted to you know write that but I also wanted to write the you know the the world the way that the community the way that I knew it so like I'm not I don't explain stuff or if I do I try to weave it in in a way that's unobtrusive and and I figure if there's a word you really want to know about you can always google it if it's that important but hopefully if I did my job you don't even it doesn't matter whether you know what it means or not you know and and also I want to ask two quick questions so then as uh, I want to you know uh, my husband even, even though he's a white guy he actually um, is taking uh lessons from um, an Ustad in uh, Philadelphia and so I'd love to and and that's where I actually got the dogs from in Star Daughter so I'd actually love to talk to you more about this down the line just you know to hear what you're what you're writing and and of course Danuta when do I get to read this London book What I'm gonna have to do is pretend that I'm on Zoom with you all every evening for two to three hours and then hole up in a corner, <laughs> quarantine within the quarantine. Uh, but hope, hopefully in the coming coming year or so, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm writing both and seeing which one gets more momentum more quickly. And I'm completely with you on the, the not explaining the words also. I did, I did the same. I didn't wanna have um, any words of South Asian origin in ITAL italics unless they sounded foreign to the protagonist yes so if dimple doesn't know the word okay maybe depending on the context but not like chuckles or you know that kind of thing so yeah i agree because it's kind of like you know for years we've been dealing with makeup brands that make nude not our nude <laughs> like a nude flesh colored, colored right or, flesh or, colored. Or well, who's flesh flesh colored, colored crayon or that kind of yeah, thing so yep, yep, yep. we got to read so, no, I, I actually I agree with, I made the choice not to italicize for emphasis, just like with any other word, right? Because yes. uh, why would we, if, if I don't, my thought was, if we don't italicize, like, like if you have a sentence that so there was a fairy and an upsara, why would upsara be italicized, but not fairy? That makes absolutely no sense. That's just othering. So I'm not doing it. Yeah. And then and also, my like, editor it's like you're it. screaming the word. So sit down yeah. and have a cup of chai. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's what italics are for. They're supposed Take to call attention to the word. So. Yeah. I'm going to have my chai tea and my naan bread yeah. with my Panera okay. bread all at the same time. <laughs> um, oh. And, you know, oh, no. I would, I no would chai actually tea, love, no naan bread, no, no, no. No, I would love to, to have, uh, to have you all back for like 
for more panels where we could talk about these other things too, because yeah, that's, it's a, it is a very like deep conversation that a lot of writers need to be having about, you know, the, the inclusion of not only words that are necessarily foreign to the mainstream audience, um, but also just like concepts and how we, how we work those in and, and how we approach doing that in each of our works. So that could be the next panel. Um, but unfortunately for this time, we're out of time for this panel, but I wanted to thank all of you um, for this. This has been a, a really beautiful conversation and I've loved hearing about all of your influences and and how you all have you know come to, to your work and, and I've just really enjoyed this. So thank you all um, for being here for this. Thank you, uh, Shweta, for suggesting it. And um, just for, for the folks in the audience, thank you for, for coming and for donating to the Carl Brandon Society. Um, if you are watching this when it is on the replay later, um, I would like to say, please check out all of these wonderful authors, their information to their websites and their works and all that stuff is gonna be in the descriptions. Please buy it. Their Twitters are in the descriptions. Follow them on Twitter so you can know when things are coming out and you can bug them and be like, where's my Bombay book? Where's my London book? And um, and support them uh, by, by buying their stuff and you know joining their crowdfunding campaigns if they have them and things like that. And if you want to support more panels like this and more uh, community opportunities for writers of color, then consider going to carlbrandon.org and dropping us a donation there. And there will be in the description of this or the post for this, there will be a link and it's also on our front page. So again, thank you all for this uh, wonderful conversation. And I look forward to having more with you very soon. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, this feels love like a everybody. Big, big group hug. Yes, love <laughs> to everybody. Like really food for the soul, sustenance for a pandemic. So thank you. And